we're talking a lot this week about the lessons of history and what they can teach us about this moment and going forward. My next guest, it's been a while since we've talked, so I'm looking forward to it, has just published a new book that I think has some pointers for us. John Nichols, you probably know his work as the Washington or National Affairs Correspondent for The Nation. He's written a ton of books. We've interviewed him about a bunch of them. And uh, his latest book is called The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist, Anti-Racist Politics. So without any further ado, John Nichols, thanks for coming back on the program. Richard, I couldn't be more honored than to be with you. Um, and, you know, we've always, our relationship has always been, uh, you know, like through Skype and distant and self-isolated. So for us, we just carry on. Yeah, and we're writers, so you know, hey, That's you know, right. what I mean? so you know, l l let me preface uh, this, and then I want to talk to you about why you wrote the book and so on. But so my my mother was who died last year at the age of ninety six was a lifelong leftist and good liberal too, and just fought for all the right causes her whole life. She didn't look like that kind of person, she but she was a powerhouse, and. Um, I literally learned about Henry Wallace at my mother's knee. Henry Wallace was a hero of my mother's. Uh, as as our, many in our audience know, he was vice president under, under Roosevelt, forced out in 1944, ran as an independent in 1948. My mother proudly noted that she voted for Henry Wallace. She was one of that 2.5% or whatever who voted for Wallace in 1948 as the kind of third party left candidate. Um, but tell us, so this was a fascinating figure in American history. Why this book and why now? Sure. Um, well, I, I probably don't have to explain to most of your audience uh, why we might be talking about the fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, because it's sort of one of the ongoing realities of the Democratic Party. Since the death of Franklin Roosevelt in 1945, uh, and, and it is important to point out that Roosevelt pulled together uh, a remarkable coalition that included uh, what would today be understood as the far left, um, all the way over to right wingers, uh, including some pretty nasty right wingers. So the Roosevelt coalition, that New Deal coalition was giant. Once he passed away, there began what is now a 75 year long struggle for the soul of the Democratic Party. And it is between uh, folks on the left and folks who are more toward the center, uh, more toward the corporate side, more uh, in some cases toward what could be described as the right. And so mm -hmm. this, is, this is nothing new. This fight's been going on. But what I wanted to do when I set out to write the book was to understand why uh, the Democratic Party had, to my view, uh, responded so ineffectually to the challenges that were posed not just by Donald Trump's presidency, but to the rise of a win at any cost extreme right, and to explore the danger of a inept or uh, insufficient response to the moment we're in. And I wanted to find the history of that. I wanted to find the roots of that struggle and, and talk about it in some fundamental ways. And so I went back to the story of Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was a remarkable figure by any measure, one of the great intellectuals of his time, a Iowan who was known uh, as a young man as a leading uh, editor and writer about farm issues and, in fact, was one of the most prominent farm activists in the United States. He had been a Republican, a liberal Republican. Uh, in 1932, Franklin Roosevelt went out of his way to reach out to Henry Wallace and ask Wallace to come and join him uh, in the 32 campaign for the presidency, which was the transformational campaign in American politics and then uh, to join his administration. Wallace joined the Roosevelt administration, the New Deal administration, on its first day as Secretary of Agriculture, and he was with Roosevelt to the end, to, the, to Roosevelt's death, uh, always a part of the administration in one way or another. Uh, he was such a central figure in the New Deal that in 1940, when Roosevelt decided that he was going to run for a third term, which was unprecedented, and he was going to try and turn the Democratic Party clearly to the left uh, to recognize the need 
to to do a lot of bold things, uh, both domestically and internationally. He got rid of his southern, more conservative vice president, John Nansgarner, and brought uh, Henry Wallace, his secretary of uh, agriculture, onto the ticket as the vice president. It was not a popular move with the Democratic establishment or with uh, the party bosses, uh, certainly not with the Southern segregationists. And so there was opposition to Wallace. Roosevelt wanted him on the ticket so desperately that he said to the commission, if you don't put Wallace on the ticket, um, then I'm not going to run either. And of course, that, that sealed the deal. Wallace joined him. And for four years, Henry Wallace was the left wing of the administration. But more than that, he was the person who really framed out what we now think of as the ideals and the, the goals of the latter part of, of Roosevelt's presidency, uh, the idea of four freedoms, the idea of an economic bill of rights, and frankly, the idea of winning the peace. And, and it's a critical thing, mm -hmm. this notion that coming out of World War II, the Democratic Party would seek to address the issues that had been unaddressed, segregation, sexism, uh, economic inequality. Uh, this was what Wallace was all about. Now, as Roosevelt was ailing in 1944, um, and, and he, was, he was not far from his death, um, they, there was a great struggle within the Democratic Party. Now, Roosevelt was focused so much on winning World War II that he essentially said to the party, I personally, if I was a delegate to the convention, would vote for Henry Wallace, but I'll let the convention decide. Frankly, he wanted the party to to pull together the biggest possible coalition for what he thought would be a hard 44 race. The party rejected, the party leadership rejected Henry Wallace. Um, they rejected him not uh, because he was unpopular with the base. He was extremely popular. They also, uh, frankly, rejected him through a scheming and, and very crass set of actions at the 1944 convention, which I write a lot about in the book. But yes, so line, I, 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 yeah, actually blocking Claude Pepper from putting his name in nomination and all that stuff. Right. I read that. Um, yeah. John Nichols, again, you know, your new book on Henry Wallace uh, in the same episode in this week's episode, we're all, also talking with our mutual friend, uh, Harvey J.K. Uh, oh, has a new yes. book out on He has a new book out on Roosevelt's speeches and writings, many that haven't been seen in decades. And what's fascinating to me about this story you're telling me, John, is that Number one, it's consistent with some of the things I read in Harvey's books, which is contrary to popular opinion, uh, FDR had a clear and what we would call, a, it seems to me, clearly left vision for this country, going back to his time in the New York State Senate. And mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. uh, when, when I hear the story about Roosevelt's work to put in Henry Wallace as vice president in 1940, uh, not a politician, never run for office as far as I know at that point, uh, no. What, what what came to mind was that it strikes me that FDR was, you know, he was already ill. He was looking to his legacy within the party and the country. And it seems to me what he was trying to do there, and I, obviously they undercut him in 1944, but my impression, correct me if I'm wrong, is that what he was trying to do there was really turn the Democratic Party into uh, a long-lasting left institution that stood for long-term change. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, well, certainly that's what Henry Wallace was about. And and I read Roosevelt's uh, speeches, diaries, he consulted with Harvey, of course, um, and many other folks. And I came to the conclusion that, uh, that Roosevelt uh, became more and more progressive. It wasn't that he didn't have progressive huh. instincts yeah. early on, but that he became more and more progressive. And that was not uncommon in this period. It's important to understand. Uh, the book that I have written it has a lot of cultural history and a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of looking at movies, looking at, at books, looking yeah. at, you know, where society was moving because society was moving to the left. And the interesting thing was that first you had the economic despair and challenge of the, of the Great Depression, but then you had the, the rise of fascism on the international stage. Mm -hmm. And it, Roosevelt understood this, uh, understood that that these struggles would not end at the end of World War II, that there would be ongoing struggles uh, with authoritarians and also with um, unresolved issues in the United States. So I think that's why he brought Wallace in. And it's very interesting. There are people who try to imagine that Roosevelt and Wallace split from one another at the end when 
when Wallace was rejected as the vice presidential nominee. That it was not the case. In fact, one of my favorite parts of the book uh, is about the period after the convention. Wallace it was a remarkable figure. Uh, he took the hit at the convention, and uh, unquestionably the nomination was stolen from him. Uh, he would mm -hmm. have been nominated, uh, but uh, he swallowed hard, went back to Iowa, uh, you know, went and did some speeches out in the countryside, which is what he always did, uh, and then came back to Washington and said, Mr. President, I'm reporting for duty. I will do whatever you need uh, to make sure that you get reelected and that uh, we carry forward. Roosevelt was so impressed with this and, and so moved that he said, you know, you, I'm going to give you any post you want in the cabinet. I, I'm, you know, you know he, he was apologetic for, for the circumstance that they ended up in. Uh, remember, Roosevelt, the, the new uh, vice president was Harry Truman. And Roosevelt had right. said at one point, I don't even know Truman. Right. So there was a this was this was still a good relationship between Wallace and Roosevelt. And then there was something remarkable that happened. Roosevelt went out on the campaign trail, and I write a lot about this in the book, that 44 campaign, imagine this, a man who was really ailing physically and, and in, in, a, in a tough spot, pushing himself as hard as he could uh, to save not just his country, but the world. Remember, in his closing days of World War II, um, he did a rally in Chicago where he effectively, it was bitter cold, 100,000 people present. Roosevelt um, essentially... Uh, adopted many of the views that Wallace had, had presented and actually went further, talking about creating millions of jobs in the post-war era, essentially restarting the New Deal um, in the post-war era, and also uh, making it much more progressive as regards social issues and racial justice, a host of other things. Wallace telegraphed him and said, and by the way, Wallace was now campaigning on his own dime, not with money from the Democratic mm -hmm. National Committee, but spending his own money to travel the country campaigning for Roosevelt. Wallace said, that's exactly the message. You're actually going further than I am. I want to tell you I will be a part of this. I want to, anything I can do, I'm a foot soldier in this army. Roosevelt sent back and said, no, no, you're not. You're going to be, you're going to have a major job. And Roosevelt made him the Secretary of Commerce, which at that, which at that time was a post that had immense power as regards the domestic economy. So there's simply no question that something real was happening here. And the possibilities in many ways seemed endless. The tragedy, of course, is that, that Roosevelt did die um, shortly after uh, assuming his fourth, beginning his fourth term. And on the funeral train, uh, Henry Wallace was on the train uh, with many other members of the administration. And he wrote in his diary that he could feel the, the pieces of the New Deal coming apart. He could mm. feel wow. things falling apart. Now, Roosevelt did pass. Um, Truman came to power. And Truman was, isn't a devil in this you know, story. He's a, he's, he was just an ineffectual figure and, and, and one who ultimately proved to be uh, insufficient for the challenges that arose, in my view. Um, and, uh, and Wallace stuck with him for a while, was forced out, and then fought, frankly, you know, as an independent leftist. But the truth of the matter was, at that point, the story was done. Uh, the effort to make the Democratic Party a fighting progressive force in the post-war era um, had been undermined. And that's where my story picks up in another way. And I won't go through all of it, but to say that the rest yeah, of the book okay. tells, and tells the story let of me jump in. each time. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted, first of all, just to remind our audience that we're talking with John Nichols, whose new book is The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, <clears throat> The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's anti-fascist, anti-racist politics. And John, if I can jump in for a second, this may yeah. be where you were going, but, but I wanted to ask you about that subtitle because to me it points to a couple important things, including Henry Wallace's life after his 1948 independent run. But I, you highlight his anti-fascism, you highlight his anti-racism in the subtitle, Clearly, we know he was economically far to the left, but you chose those two topics. And in a second, I'm going to ask you why. But uh, one of the things that jumps out at me from your book is that Wallace could have ch chosen in some way to build on the coalition 
the democratic coalition of economically liberal, if not left, uh, politicians and racist Dixiecrats. But it, it, the impression I get is that Wallace was so deeply anti-racist, and we can talk about anti-fascist too, but so and should, but so deeply anti-racist that he was not willing to do that for on moral grounds, which is admirable. And, and the Wallace uh, story from that point forward, especially, although certainly it played, it, it affected his career earlier on as well, the resistance he got in 1944 and earlier. But it seems to me what we see now a lot in the Democratic Party is what I consider a false uh, binary between the politics of social and identity justice and the politics of economic justice. And it seems to me that one of the enduring characteristics of Henry Wallace is that he would not compromise on either and that that shaped the arc of his political life. What, what do you think of that thesis? I think it's exactly right. And I think he, he wove it all together and he refused to um, believe that you couldn't have a, a Democratic Party that was committed to economic and social and racial justice, to protecting the planet, and he was a, a pioneering conservationist, and to building peace uh, at home and abroad. He believed it was all possible. He was not a naive idealist. He was one of the most successful businessmen uh, of his era, and he was also one of the most uh, successful political figures, at least for a time. And, and so his vision was made today seem, you know, to some people like it was radical or way ahead of his time. Actually, the thing that I argue is he saw the reality of the struggles that were to come. And he determined that the Democratic Party had to go forward. It had to harness the energy of the, uh, of the fights that they were in, uh, fight against economic injustice and economic uh, crisis in the Depression era and then the fight against fascism in the World War II era. And, and he recognized very early on that racism was a barrier to building the coalitions that were necessary, to building the politics that was necessary. And so he put a focus on fighting against racism that was actually quite remarkable uh, in almost every sense. And um, the key moment came in 1943 uh, midway into uh, his term as vice president, uh, there was a race riot. In fact, there were a lot of race riots, and I had to devote a good chunk of the book to one of the realities of the World War II era that's, I think, a little lost in a, a lot of our histories. Uh, we were not a united country. Uh, we were united against the Nazis, pretty much, but, uh, boy, there were deep divisions at home, and people really wrestled with a, a lot of fundamental questions. And there were race riots in, in a number of cities in 1943. Uh, African-American activists like A. Philip Randolph uh, were actively campaigning uh, to integrate war industries and also to, you know, basically, you know, shift the country on, on issues of race. And they were great heroes in this period. Uh, they had some success. And unfortunately, that then created circumstances where racists uh, tried to exploit divisions, tried to, you know, get people fighting with one another. Uh, in Detroit, things went really bad. Uh, and the race riot saw a number of deaths. Um, it, days after it occurred, Henry Wallace flew, chartered a plane, and flew to Detroit. Uh, he was very close to the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the United Auto Workers, and other unions. And so he addressed a huge rally of about uh, thousands of, of workers, an integrated rally. And he said something that was actually quite remarkable. Uh, he said that uh, they would... Uh, I apologize. I'm, another phone went off here. But what Wallace said at that point was that uh, those who would use racism to divide people at that time in the United States were using the same tactics and, and engaging the same behaviors as the people were fighting against in Europe. He essentially equated racism with fascism. And, and this was an incredibly talk, powerful second, message. Uh -huh. Yeah. And again, we're talking with John Nichols, whose new book is on Henry Wallace. And I do want to pivot to fascism. It's perfect. Uh, in the five minutes or so we have left, he's, he, he, two quotes that I highlighted from your book, John. Quote, we cannot fight to crush Nazi brutality abroad and condone race riots at home. Those who fan the fires of racial clashes, etc., are taking the first step toward Nazism. The second quote regarding fascism 
quote, the people of America know that the second step toward fascism is the destruction of labor unions. There are midget mm -hmm. Hitlers mm -hmm. here who continually attack labor. Fascinating to me to weave those two threads together under the rubric uh, uh, of fascism. And I wonder just in the few minutes we have left, if you wanted to talk a little bit about his take on American fascism. Yeah, I mean, this is really, you're getting to the heart of the matter. And the fact is that Henry Wallace um, was very conscious of the need to do all of these things together. And when I say all these things together, using that phrase, um, he knew you had to fight economic injustice, social injustice, racial injustice, and you couldn't de-link these things. And he knew that those with economic and political power who didn't want that progress would, in fact, um, you know, try to sow the divisions, try to put people at odds with one another. And, and so he did talk about these things in, in a lot of contexts, and he was attacked for it during World War II. The New York Times literally attacked him for trying to divide the country and for putting people at odds with one another. And he wrote an epic essay for the Times, uh, The Danger of American Fascism. In that essay, he outlined uh, many of the things that we're talking about here, how those who would seek to divide this country and those who would seek to move this country uh, back from the progress, not just the New Deal, but from the progress of the World War II era, um, would move after the war, would move after the war to stir up racial divisions, to stir up social divisions, to stir up economic divisions. And he said you had to have strong trade unions, you had to have a what we would come to know as a strong civil rights movement. And so he was talking about all of this, and he was attacked for it. There is no question in my mind that one of the reasons he was pushed off the ticket in 1944 was because he was talking about this. And it, again, the title of the book is you know, Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. And that goes to the heart of it, because he wasn't pushed off the Democratic ticket by conservative Republicans. Right. He wasn't pushed out by, you know, right wingers outside the party. He was pushed out by people in the party, some of them even relatively sincere, moderate to modestly liberal folks who thought the country just wasn't ready for it. And to my mind, Richard, this is the great reality throughout history that the Democratic Party has too frequently pulled its punches because they thought the country wasn't ready for it. And as such, it has slowed progress that was necessary. And what we need to take away from Henry Wallace is that decades ago, there was an American vice president who said, you could and should fight for economic and social and racial justice for saving the planet and for peace. And that when he did so, he was pushed away, he was undermined, but he laid down a marker that is a marker we ought to pick up today. And that's basically the message of the book. It's a core message. And, and the last thing I'll say, you know, because I know we don't have a lot of time, is that, that Henry Wallace has been so written out of our history, uh, so dismissed, that there are many people who don't know how, that they're part of a struggle that has gone on for the better part of a century. And knowing that history, knowing that history does two things. Number one, it tells us that um, we knew all along what we should do. That's important. It, it sets history straight, but it okay. also tells us that when we do the right thing, you know, when something that seems radical today, um, if we don't do it today, right, we will someday in the future regret that we didn't. So you look at an issue like the Green New Deal, you look at, at mm -hmm. so many of the issues that are in play. If we don't do it now, we will regret it. That's the lesson of Henry Wallace. We should have done what he was saying in the 40s. We didn't. Uh, today, we had to learn from that lesson and embrace the message of, you know, going bold, going big, doing, believing in what is possible. Well, I couldn't put it better myself. And of course, there are aspects of the Wallace story we didn't even get into in, uh, enough, like his his view of foreign relations, military relations, Cold War, and so on. So it's a fascinating book. I recommend it. I thank you for writing it. I thank you for joining us. Again, my guest has been John Nichols. His new book is The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist, Anti-Racist Politics. As always, John, thank you.
Thank you so much for having me. And, and I hope we get together again to talk more about it, because, as you know, I love talking about it and I love talking about it to someone like you who really understands so much of the history. Well, thank you, brother. I like that, too. And I look forward to it.